Welcome back to part three of the Tandy 1000 saga. Now, if you uh, have the misfortune of recalling my first video, you remember that was all about how I'd gotten this bare Tandy 1000 EX uh, and uh, had proceeded to design my first prototypes of a series of expansion cards to turn it into turn the bare 256k machine into a complete computer. Well, since then. I've uh, been a bit busy. I have run a second run of prototype cards. And uh, as I mentioned at the end of that last video, I was also given the motherboard of a Tandy 1000HX, which of course is the sister machine of the Tandy 1000EX, and mentioned that I was going to be using that to uh, test my uh, next set of prototype cards in. So. Essentially, while I was working on those cards and then waiting for the boards to come in, and waiting for parts to arrive, I uh, got to work. And uh, I probably will need to take several videos to talk about everything I've been working on lately, but this one is going to be all about building what I call the Tandy 1000 SUX. If you don't get that reference, uh, I will put a little picture in picture in the corner and you can guess which movie it's from. So uh, without any further ado, let me talk about this magnificent machine I've built here, which is a homebrew Tandy 1000. All right, here we are. I have the power, of course, all turned off because we're going to be digging around in the innards here. And I've also set the camera for fixed focus because it was hunting around all over the place. So hopefully it's clear. We'll find out. So, um, the gift I received in the mail uh, for my troubleshooting purposes here was just the Tandy 1000 HX motherboard. Uh, it appears to be an early serial number, so it's an early specimen. It actually has a large number of patch wires on it. Uh, so, I don't know if it's atypical as HX's go, but I have the motherboard. And I got the uh, power supply with it, which is a scary bare board. So, <clears throat> first thing I did here is, uh, I'll just go ahead and open this up. It's not bolted together in any way right now. Is I screwed the motherboard, as you can see using offsets to a small piece of plexiglass. You know, standard off-the-shelf Lexan. A neighbor was tossing these out, so I got it for free. So I, I screwed the motherboard to a piece of Lexan to uh, prevent it from being shorted when it's resting on a table. And uh, the next thing, of course, I decided I needed was a keyboard. So, uh, Tandy 1000 keyboards, to say the least, are not common devices. And keyboards for these integrated models are even less common. Uh, the standard Tandy 1000 is designed like a PC keyboard, in which the uh, keyboard, it's a matrix of wires, and then it has an intelligent controller chip on it, which is a small microcontroller, usually like an Intel 8048 or something along those lines, that... Um, uses its uh, GPIO ports to regularly scan the keyboard matrix, and then that is sent over serial to the motherboard via that 5-pin connector. Well, the Tandy 1000 actually has that scanning chip on the motherboard. So it actually just has the matrix key connectors on the motherboard. Uh, it's got the... Uh, horizontal and vertical matrix as a 12 and 13 pin header right here. So, uh, believe me, I did look on eBay. You know, of course, could not find a bare HXEX keyboard component, and neither could I find for a reasonable price. I mean, my assumption is that the keyboard itself is probably the same as what's actually in the cased keyboards for uh, standalone Tandy 1000s with the little 
keyboard on it to with with with, with this chip inside the keyboard. Uh, those are pretty much an obtainium and very expensive when you can't find them. So, uh, my first theory was actually to uh, get a large bag of little key switches. Uh, maybe I'll throw one of those, a picture of one of those in, and uh, put it on, make a matrix out of perf board. Well, uh, after experiencing the quality of those little push buttons, I decided that wasn't going to work. So, I went out to the garage and looked through all of my keyboards to see if it was possible to adapt the matrix of a, another keyboard. Now, if you disassemble most modern keyboards, what you're going to find is essentially a sheet of plastic, basically two sheets of plastic, which have printed circuit boards, uh, printed circuit wires on them. It's like a flexible PCB board, essentially. And those will go to sensors that are under each key Generally, it's called a rubber dome keyboard, and uh, I did not see any great prospects for patching one of those. However, I had this keyboard. This is a keyboard from an early 90s WISE terminal. Now, before anyone shoots me for chopping up an old terminal, the terminal itself is long dead. It went into electronic recycling a dozen years ago it was non-functional i got it at a garage sale i discovered the serial port was blown up i mean if i had it today i would probably attempt to fix it but the terminal was gone but the keyboard remained now this keyboard is not rubber dome it has cherry key switches and very useful for this project this keyboard has a circuit board on it which is connected to all the keys but critically uh, this key this circuit board is single-sided so there's a lot of spots you'll see these jumper these these jumper pin areas where the places where the matrix needs to jump across traces they sink it through the hole and there's a little metal wire on the other side What's good about this is it meant that this keyboard's matrix could be easily reprogrammed simply by cutting loose every key and then resoldering your own wires. So this project took about three weeks. Now, um, I'll be honest, you know, I, I thought maybe in retrospect I should have filmed that for the channel. Uh, I am such a klutz at soldering, I decided nobody wanted to see that. But, you know, if in the future you'd like to see me be a klutz with soldering and would like to see more actual process videos of the weird stuff I do, maybe you can make it happen. But, uh, as you can see, essentially what I did to this poor board, you may be able to see some of the little marks. I took this poor board outside and I use a Dremel cutting wheel to, you know, basically look at the board and every, see every key has two connectors on it, two, two contacts. I went saw, 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 you know, about 200 times cutting loose every key from the printed circuit wires on this board. So as a wise terminal keyboard, it's never going to walk again. Uh, then using the uh, matrix diagram that's in the service manual. I resoldered the X and Y matrix using all these little jumpers of different colored wires into the proper shape. I connected it to these, these two ribbon cables right here. And then the whole mess. Oh. Rotator back around, ah, terminates at a 34 pin, basically a floppy connector, which is then connected to this little circuit board right here. Now from there, this is the trick. The original board connected via those uh, ribbon cables. Uh, it's essentially, you know, again, it's essentially like a flexible PCB board. It's a piece of plastic. It's flexible. It has metal contacts on it and it terminates in a zero insertion force kind of socket 
yeah, you if you've taken apart electronics before, you've probably seen these where it, like there's a clip it pulls up, the plastic ribbon goes into it, pushes down, and it holds. So I could not find any good substitute or any any pre-printed sheet that I could cut of that. So the idea I came up with is each one of these bundles of wires terminates in a you know essentially this this is a this is a two row header but um, you know it's a single row. Uh, I soldered the ends of these wires to a 0.1 inch pitch uh, header single uh, single row and those are essentially just crammed into the ribbon connector and it mostly works um it's the reason this is all together on this piece of plexiglass here is because it needs to be stable and if it gets messed with it'll i'll start losing the key it up so honestly if you are going to make this permanent you being me Probably the correct thing to do if you can't find the ribbon cable would be to remove those connectors off the motherboard and replace them with a matching header connector. I haven't done that yet because, frankly, I'm afraid of desoldering on that board. Um, I'm not good at desoldering, and I'm pretty worried. It's uh, To be honest, you know, we love these Tandy machines. Uh, Tandy was cheap. And that is possibly the cheapest fiberglass I have ever seen. But uh, anyway, also you may have noticed this blue alligator clip here. This is because for some reason, I mean, I've pegged it out with the voltmeter. The signal is there, but I cannot get the pin for that to engage. So for the space bar row to work, I had to put in this other jumper. It's for some reason not making the connector and not making it into the ribbon cable. So that's how we did the keyboard. Now, the case itself is made out of scrap wood. It's actually scrap wood from an old crib. It's actually the drawer that used to pull out and add the uh, kids stuff in it. That crib's again been scrapped and thrown away, but I saved some of the lumber for it because it seemed like it might be useful. Let me show you a piece of it. Still have some. You see how it's notched like this. Um, it was notched to hold the floor of the drawer, which was this thin fiber board, like so, which means if you can cut it into a little box, and cut a piece of the floor correctly, it'll easily hold in. So to make the box, I simply cut the two side pieces to, to shape to fit a piece of the bottom. Uh, and then I put a, another piece of wood here on the bottom and a trim to hold the uh, keyboard and use a couple pieces to lock it in the back. And as you see, what I've done here is I've drilled a couple holes through the plexiglass to hold this in place. Uh, it's in here loosely, so if I want to pull this all out, I can just undo these two nuts and I can lift the entire thing out. Ooh, sorry about that. A little bit of a jump cut. My uh, camera ran out of battery. So uh, anyway, yeah, so the case, as you mentioned, is built of uh, scrap lumber with this fiberboard floor. I mean, honestly, uh, it's not the best in the world. You can see this flexes a bit. It makes me a little nervous pushing boards in and out of it. Um, but what can you say? <clears throat> we'll call this uh, version one. Uh, again, you see the sides. That's all built from the scrap crib wood. I built a little enclosure here on the side. Uh, I guess I need to uh, move it a bit to show you that. So I capped off the um, capped off where the power supply sits under here with this piece of wood. I drilled a hole. So the power supply screwed to the side, and the power switch is right here. You know, it was attached to the original board on the original machines. Of course, it protrudes out the side. But uh, I have it vertically here 
because I decided to make the case the same width as the keyboard. That was the, uh, the basis for all the other dimensions, and it was not enough space to put it horizontally. So I made it vertically, yep, power it on and off right there. So if we go back and look inside again, back under the keyboard, you can see the power supply is connected, the stock cable, which came with it. Uh, I have a rot gut old PC case fan in here, which is connected to the original header for a fan. Um, I don't think, honestly, this thing really needs a fan in terms of cooling, especially with it wide open like this. But the specs for the power supply do suggest it should have a minimum load on the 12 volt line. And since the, um, essentially nothing in this uses 12 volts except for the serial ports, because, you know, not even the, the GoTek floppy uh, emulator only uses five volts. So I figure the fan is just an insurance policy to make sure we don't roast the 12 volt line on the power supply. Uh, so what else? Um, there are some holes drilled in this side. You see the uh, uh, joystick ports and the sound port are accessible on the outside. You see I have an audio cable plugged into the headphone jack. The reason for that is I haven't found a matching speaker for the internal speaker header, and I figure it might be bad for the amplifier to not have a load on it. So I've been solving that by keeping a pair of headphones or something plugged in. In this case, this audio cable goes to the built-in speaker on the Commodore monitor here. So, uh, you may have noticed these two LEDs sitting here. These are connected to the headers, which are controlled, again, by the keyboard controller chip. These are the caps lock and num lock uh, keys, and they do work. Uh, so if you use the keys that I have assigned to those functions on the keyboard, they actuate and deactuate as you expect. So... Um, Possibly the last interesting thing about this build is the floppy controller over here. So if you're at all familiar with the later models of the Tandy 1000 line, where they started building three and a half inch drives into them, uh, Radio Shack, for whatever reason, decided to make the floppy connector proprietary. So in a normal floppy drive, you've got the signal cable, you know, standard 34 pin signal cable, and then there's the power connector, which has five and 12 volts on it. It's carried separately. Uh, for whatever reason, um, Tandy made proprietary floppy drives for these machines that carried both the power and the signaling over the signal, the single 34 pin cable. Now, the problem with that is that connector, uh, they essentially the standard Shugart connector, it's got two rows of 17 pins each, 34 pins, one is a key. Uh, essentially, one side of it uh, is, I believe it's the odd side is entirely grounds. So that's good because it means that if you were to accidentally plug it in the wrong way, you're generally not shorting an output with an output. You're shorting all any outputs and inputs to ground, which generally won't hurt TTL uh, unless you keep it up for too long. Unfortunately, Tandy reused some of those ground lines for 5 volts and 12 volts. Now, the 5 volt isn't such a big deal, but if 12 volts gets fed into some of the TTL signal lines, that's bad and you will blow something up. So, how do we convert this to run a standard floppy drive? 
Now there, there are uh, actually commercial. I say commercial. You can order some some PCB board solutions, which do a good job. Uh, basically, you can plug into the original cable that's in an HX, and it will convert it to uh, a standard 34 pin without the power. And you know, Bob's your uncle. Uh, I elected. You know, I was thinking of making a custom cable for this. Ugh. But instead, I elected to come up with a shortcut, which I can show you here. So if you look carefully at this, I have plugged into the motherboard header a 34-pin stacking header which is actually one of these 40 pin stacking headers. I just cut it down short uh, a little bit. And basically the on the odd side, the first pin is not connected, so you don't really need it, but we don't really care. After that, the next uh, five pins on this side, these are the five volt lines right here. And then the last three lines at the end here those are the 12 volt lines. So what I did, as you see, I folded these all flat, folded them over, and voila, the remaining ground lines are plenty. The pinouts of the uh, uh, even side are standard. So all I need to do is just take my standard floppy cable. You know, there's some tape on here. This is, I converted this from a standard twisted cable, you can see here, and I kind of mangled this getting it off and reclipping it. So do a nicer job than I did. As you see, I have the GoTek floppy drive here and I don't need to put an adapter at this end now because I did it on the motherboard, but this idea of using the stacking header should work just as well. If you made this exactly the same way and just plugged it in at this end, it would also neuter out the power. But you see the other thing I did here is I soldered a single wire to one of these five volt pins and I carry it to this simple pin header, which I've plugged in. See, I've got it. So with the pin, see, I just, this is actually the piece I saw it off of this stocking header. So if you look at it, you can see I bent the pins so I can't plug it in the wrong way without it hitting the, the cable. So I know of the, of the, correct orientation for it. So then it just carries the five volts to the first pin adjacent to the signal con connector on the drive's floppy connector. And that's all you need to power the GoTech. Uh, the ground pin on the power connector is common with the ground pins that are on the signal cable. So you don't, you don't, e you don't even need two wires, just the one power it. Now, if you were going to power a real floppy drive, you could do the same thing other than you'd just need to take, you'd also need to solder a wire to one of these 12 volt pins we've bent over and also connect it. Now, you may have noticed I put tape over the 12 volt pins that I bent over. Reason being is they're the ones that would be really dangerous if they accidentally shorted against something else on the motherboard. So playing it safe there. So anyway, that is the physical build. Uh, now you may have noticed these two cards right here. Those are the new expansion cards, which we can talk about in a minute. But let me go ahead and just put this keyboard back up here. Oh. As you see, I made this, this has a, the width of the circuit board right here. Uh, the width of the circuit board is almost exactly the width between the two walls. And that just means that this will easily just rest flat in here. There's a little bend in the metal that I made for a notch. It fits in there. It's a good friction fit. Now, if you look carefully at the uh, keyboard matrix, you may notice that this keyboard, again, this is, this is not a PC layout. These Wise terminals actually were sold with two different keyboards. There was one that looks much more like a PC 101 key keyboard. That keyboard was used for 
uh, things like PC MOS and other applications with multi-user DOS. And then there was a more generic ASCII keyboard, which is what this is, which is close to a PC layout, but not exactly. And again, <clears throat> before anyone yells at me about cutting this up, this is a very common keyboard. It's a, I won't say it's a dime a dozen, but there's tons of them on eBay. The world will do without one. So, as you see, uh, I tried to make it spatially match the original Tandy keyboard for the most part. Like, for instance, because of the differences, like on, a, on the original Tandy keyboard, there are two rows of keys between the numeric, the numeric pad and the main group. There's only one here. So I moved the hold key way up here because we hate the hold key anyway. This key, this page, previous, next, I actually just made that the uh, numlock key because that's about where it is on the original keyboard. But uh, there's no alt key on this keyboard, but there is a function key and that actually works out well. I mean, you can draw a delete. Bang. Uh, this first insert key over here is a standard insert key. These are all dead. I didn't, except for the enter key. Um, <sighs> it would be cool if I could reuse some of the, like this is also a dead key because it doesn't, the Tandy key doesn't, keyboard doesn't have it. It'd be cool to put some logic on the matrix. So if you hit, say, this key or this key, you'd actually get the symbol that was on it. But, uh, we didn't do that today. So anyway, um, there she is. I will go ahead and power it up and give you a quick rundown that prove it does indeed work. Just a moment. All right, we'll just go ahead and hit the hidden power switch and let her fly. As you see, she recognizes 640K. And uh, I'll just leave it up here. Now, the uh, for a hard disk right now, I'm using an SD to CF converter. And as these uh, messages just show, if you remember the last video, I'm using the same... Uh, use UMB and DOS Max uh, <clears throat> software stack to load DOS 5 and some drivers high for this thing. So uh, there you go. It has a heartbeat. Now I mentioned the uh, these LEDs right here. You can see the red one is caps lock and the green one is... Uh, numlock and all the keys including that stubborn space bar they all work so if we go ahead and uh, zoom in on the screen here a bit i can go ahead and give you a quick rundown of the hardware configuration that we've got achieved on this thing so if i go into well first i'll go ahead and do this As you can see, we have the same uh, approximately 610K of RAM as the uh, as we achieved with the EX with the other set of boards. There's a little less free RAM because this machine, because of the layout of uh, Tandy 1000 HX's memory, can only have 96K worth of UMBs with the ROM configuration for the hard disk instead of 128K. But if we go ahead fire up check it we can get a quick rundown of what's going on here. So take a look at configuration. We have uh, 
the V20 machine, which I have also upgraded this machine to a V20. I did an initial round of tests with just the original 8088 in it, and then I've upgraded it because I bought two of those chips on eBay. Why waste it? Uh, it's got the same Tandy 1000-ism of having only 624K actually accessible to DOS. Uh, as you see, we have a 2 gig hard drive, and we have two COM ports, and three button mouse attached. Now, if we go ahead and we look at the memory map, So here's the uh, memory map. Uh, you can see standard conventional memory. You can see it labels the, see there's the 16K of CGA RAM, this high RAM, which remember is actually a shadow of this on the Tandy 1000. It identifies the uh, hard disk ROM is occupying 8K of the available 32K of flash memory at C000. It identifies as a video ROM because that's where EGA and VGA ROMs usually reside. And then you see high memory for DOS starts at C800 and goes all the way to DEFFF. So we've got 96K here and the remainder, the 64K unknown ROM is the built-in ROM uh, file system that HXs have and the rest is a standard PC BIOS. So if we go ahead and go to say the serial ports, and go ahead and shh, I don't have a loop back, so I'll have to use the internal loop back, but we can go ahead and demonstrate that they work. And if we go ahead and benchmark main system. So here's the results. These results are identical to those of the Tandy 1000 EX. So one of the questions that has come up from time to time is if there's actually any hidden differences between these machines that makes one faster than the other. So far as I can tell, there's no difference. Both top bench and this benchmark peg them at exactly the same speed. So if we go ahead and exit this, look at the hard disk benchmark. All right, you may notice this uh, result of over 500K a second is higher than was posted in the last video with the EX. That is actually because I have swapped the ROM image that's being used on these. The, there's a standard XDIDE ROM image that works with any 80X CPU, uh, which includes the 8088 that these shipped with, and I had that in there for cross-compatibility reasons. But since both have a V20 now, I went ahead and upgraded the ROMs to a version which uses uh, 186 instructions, which uh, the 186 includes like this string transfer function for transferring uh, data from ports that almost doubles the transfer speed of XDIDE. So that's why you get 500k a second. Um, the, e the EX is actually slightly faster than this machine for this test, and it seems to be because the uh, CF cards are actually slightly faster than this SD to CF adapter. So the new board actually will go ahead and take uh, SD cards, uh, CF cards, I've got, um, I'm using the SD adapter in it now, but it will also take one of these. As you see, I've swapped the connector being used for this from a standard desktop 40 pin IDE connector to this smaller connector, because there are, it's both more compact and there are very cheap adapters for doing both of these that have a more standardized pin out than what's available for the larger connector. So anyway, uh, I have run the memory test multiple cycles on this. It passes. Uh, 
seems to be all good. So, uh, this is uh, one of the many things that's been keeping me busy the last few weeks. And uh, I will probably have to go ahead and cut this video off to right here. And I will hopefully be able to post another video where I can talk more in detail about the new expansion cards that we're running with here. The fun I've had with uh, testing them and uh, some of the new things that I'm working with. Uh, hint, an Ethernet card. So uh, until next time, thank you for watching and uh, see you again soon. Thank you.